Good morning. Let's all stand. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. As we begin our service this morning, first and foremost, we want to pray for those that are traveling, those of our family and of our fellowship, Lord, that 
have uh, traveled out of town for Thanksgiving and are now making their way home, Lord. We just pray for traveling mercies for them, Lord, that you'd keep them safe. Lord, we want to pray for Ben's voice this morning, and it seems like he's been struggling for the last month and a half or so, Lord. Just whatever's going on with his vocal cords, Lord, we pray that you just heal it. But Lord, we are thankful. We are thankful, Father, for your mercy. We are thankful, Father, that you love us. We're thankful for your grace and for your forgiveness, Lord. We are thankful, Father, that you're an ever-present help in a time of need. We are thankful, Father, that you supply all of our needs according to your riches in heavenly places through Christ Jesus. Lord, we are thankful this morning that what you have begun, you're going to finish. Lord, we are a thankful bunch of people. Lord, and may we express it this morning in our time of worship as we raise our hands and surrender, as we lift our voices and praise and open our hearts in gratitude, Father, to the true and living God who loves us beyond our ability to comprehend, who will never leave us nor forsake us. Father, we are honored this morning that your presence is here and we are thankful, Father, for all that you have done. We just express these things this morning in Jesus' name. And all God's kids would say, Amen. Amen. Hey, let's remain standing. Water, you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is sealer Awesome in power Our God Our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? If our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? If our God is with us, then what could stand against? Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God.
You may be seated. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in a glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse is lost, it's I am his and he is mine, but with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final prayer, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man could ever pluck me from his hands till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand No power of hell, no scheme of man Could ever pluck me from his hands Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I stand Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I stand Love. 
near there to thy love that's blessed me thou hast brought me to this place and i know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace jesus taught me when a stranger wandering from to rescue me from danger and impose this precious blood.
Father, we, we understand. As you spoke through the prophet Amos, and you declared that you would do nothing until first you revealed those things to your servants, the prophets. And Lord, we do understand from the study of eschatology that we are approaching, and we are in that time, Father, uh, that the Bible describes as the last of the last days. We can see it. We can sense it. We can feel it. The world knows it. Madison Avenue knows it. Hollywood knows it. They've been producing films about it. Lord, we know that. And Lord, it is a time that we need, Father, to be about your business You've told us that we need to labor while it's yet light because darkness comes when no man can labor. And Lord, as we're going through the holiday seasons where family members are going to get together and many times, Lord, we, we have family members who aren't believers. Father, give us a great boldness and a sense of urgency to be about your business and to share, Father, our faith, to share your gospel, your good news, Father. Because it is good news. We're not religious here at Gold Country Calvary Chapel. Never want to be religious. We have a relationship with the one who made us. And the one who calls us by name. Who loves us infinitely more than we could ever understand. And his love toward us is it's amazing. And so Father, help us to share with others the hope that we have in you, Lord. 
And of course, Lord, we lift those needs of the fellowship before you. There are a number of people that are homesick that have called and we pray for them and Jim and Susan are among those high fever. Whatever's going through this flu and cold season. Lord, we want to pray for Ben. He's been struggling with his voice and maybe has a cold in his vocal cords or whatever. Father, we thank you for his faithfulness to be here Sunday after Sunday, irregardless of how he feels or how his voice sounds, Lord. And you honor faithfulness and we pray, Father, that you'd heal his voice. Lord, it's the gift that you have given him to minister, Father, to you and and doing that to us. And we we pray for healing. Lord, we pray for Lisa and for Steve as they're dealing with the cancer, Father. And just, again, we ask for healing and for Angela and for Dave and for Pastor Aaron, who, for whatever reason, has something going on in his physical body that, Lord, only you can touch. Again, we pray for those of our fellowship, of our family, because this is more than just a church that we attend. This is a family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ who, Lord, you have joined together. You have placed us in this body as it has pleased you, Lord. And many of them are traveling, Lord, and we do pray during this season. Very dangerous to be on the roads with the weather and just the weirdos, Lord. And, and we, we, we just pray, Father, for safe travel, that you bring them back home quickly and safely, Lord. But Lord, above all things this morning, now even if I'm struggling with my voice and whatever's going around is going around, but above all things this morning, we thank you, Father, for your mercy and for your grace. Because, Lord, we understand that by our performance, we fall so short of your glory. And that by and through the works of the law, we could never be saved. But we thank you this morning that your grace is sufficient and that your mercies are new every morning. We thank you this morning, Lord, by an act of your authority, you have declared us to be righteous. And you impute that righteousness to us every moment of the day. Lord, that's what we're thankful for this morning. And in the Thanksgiving season, we are very thankful, Father, that we're your sons and your daughters, we're your kids. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's kids would say, amen. Amen. Hey, spend a few moments greeting one another before you settle back into your spot this morning. Hey, good morning. And I got...
All right, if you guys could come and settle in this morning, we'll get moving. Got a lot going on. Okay. It's always interesting. You have to ring a bell in this church to get you guys to stop fellowshipping. You know, I've often thought, when we get to heaven, what is Jesus going to have to do at the Mary Supper of the Lamb to get Gold Country Calvary Chapel to go sit down? I don't know. I'll maybe sound the trumpet again or something. Hey, listen, I've got a few announcements this morning. And number one, continue to pray, if you will. Um, for Ben and my voice. I, I don't know what's going on. I don't know. I know Ben has been struggling for about as long as I have, and I, we don't know what it is, but there's something going on in our vocal cords, and we just need prayer. Amen? I had somebody call me the other day, and I answered the phone. I, Karis, I sent her on an errand, and they talked to me for about two or three minutes before they realized who they were talking to. And they were trying to tell me, give Pastor Mike a message, and I'm, I'm talking to them, and finally they said, oh, this is you. Yeah, it's me. Well, you don't sound like you. Well, pray. So be praying for us. The, the, whatever's going on will, will be done. Amen? Hey, don't forget, as we saw last week in that vivid and uh, live commercial, uh, that they're going to have a ugly sweater an ugly sweater party. And it's going to be at uh, Barbara Sidebottom's house Friday, December the 9th. It's coming up quick at 5.30. And if you need any details, there's these little things in the back. You can pick those up. You need to sign up for that. Don't forget to sign up for the fellowship list that's uh, going to be coming out after the first of the year. If there's any changes in your name, address, or whatever, you need to fill one of these things out. Uh, don't forget that we're having our Christmas play. It's December uh, the 18th, the 17th Saturday night and 18th Sunday morning. Invite your family and friends and you have these cards to hand out and there are, there are flyers too, those big posters that you can take and put into somebody's business. And don't forget to continue to pray for Dylan as he's still on his missions trip. Yeah, we had some pictures of him being in the Philippines, but he went to Cambodia, he went to Vietnam, he went to the Philippines. And uh, now he's working his way back to the Bible College in Hawaii, suffering for Jesus. Pray for him. How many would like to be in Bible College in Hawaii? Yeah. Pray for him. And don't forget to pray for our work there in Uganda, going very well, Pastor Nicholas, and then Pastor Doug and Destiny in New Zealand. Amen? Well, let's turn our Bibles this morning while I still have a voice. Matthew chapter 9, we've come as far as verse 14, and that's where we'll pick up this morning. Matthew chapter 9, turn there to verse 14. Put your finger on it and let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. How remarkable it is. How encouraging. Lord, as we understand that it is you that is speaking, the pen in your hand may be, may be Matthew. But these are your words to us. And Lord, as we're looking at the life of Jesus, God incarnate, the Messiah, as he is speaking and ministering, Lord, so much, so much, Father, for us to learn. And so this morning, as we work our way through, hopefully through, the rest of chapter 9, we'll see this morning. What we would ask, Lord, is that you would open our hearts. Because we're going to see this morning, it's not about religion. You can't pour new wine in an old skin. And it's not about the things that we do. It's about what we are. Those are the things that concern you, Father. You're more concerned about the servant than you are the service. You're more concerned about what's going on in our hearts than what's going on in our heads. And so, Father, this morning, speak to our hearts. Because we believe and we understand that the heart will always make a convert of the head. And so, Lord, may your spirit be at work. As we study your word, we pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. You know, Matthew is just a very interesting gospel. It's, for me, the most interesting of the synoptic gospels because Matthew doesn't follow a chronological order. He really follows more of a kind of a theological order as he's laying out principles. He lays the foundation and then he builds upon those principles all the way until chapter 9, verse 9, when he introduces himself there and what God did for him. So just by way of reminder, let's take a look at that because it will make sense as we move on into verse 14 and the rest of chapter 9. This whole thing begins really back in chapter 5 when there Matthew is recording Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And there's a real design, if I could say that word, a real design to it, in that he begins with our conversion experience. Everything begins with your conversion experience. Listen, that's why Paul writes that we have every heavenly blessing in Christ Jesus. Outside of Christ Jesus, we have nothing. We are lost and undone. And it's not about being in a religious system. It's not about going through religious, you know, kind of routines or being, you know, Uh, filled with religious practices it's about a relationship with the one who made you and the one who made me and so he starts out in chapter 5 when Jesus is teaching on the Beatitudes and really as we go through those Beatitudes as we said before and we say now again this morning they are a description of your conversion experience where you come to that point of being just so poor in spirit, you understand that there's nothing about you that is redeemable and that you are broken to the core. How many had that experience? Broken to the core. And then you begin to mourn for your condition and you begin to cry out and hunger and thirst for righteousness and God fills you. That's your conversion experience. And it's listed there as we go through those Beatitudes. And then he begins to deal with heart issues. Very important, as we're going to see this morning as we go on through chapter 9, God's concerned about what is going on in your heart. Because Jesus said, you've heard it said of old, thou shalt not commit murder. Now, I don't know if any of you in this room have committed murder. I hope not. But Jesus said, if you have hatred in your heart towards somebody, You've already committed the act of murder because murder starts in the heart. Jesus said, you've heard it said of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. And I would dare say this morning, and I wouldn't embarrass any man, there's not a man in this room or a woman that hasn't committed adultery in their heart. So Jesus, after the conversion experience, deals with the heart. And then he deals with the attitude, judge not lest you also be judged for with what measure you judge, you will be judged. He deals with our attitudes. Then he moves on to our priorities. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And guess what? All this other stuff will be added to you. Then he talks about going through storms and having faith. Then he talks about Spiritual warfare and how God has the power to deliver us from that. Then he talks about the forgiveness of sins and all of those things were demonstrated and things that Jesus did. And Matthew was saying all of these things. He's he's leading up to this one point, to this one verse, as we saw last week. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. And after all of this, he says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man. He didn't see a sinner. He didn't see a Levite who had rejected his religion and walked away and now is working for the Roman Empire and there is a thief and a corrupt man. He didn't see that. He saw a man. He saw a man in his need. And he said to Matthew, follow me. And Matthew immediately left everything but his pen and he followed Jesus, and he's pinning now this gospel for us. So all of that, it comes to this. And then as he moves past that point of chapter 9, verse 9, he moves into this thing about talking to us about relationship. Now, I want you to know that I'm not religious, and I pray to God you would never become religious unless we define religion by the Latin word relingere, which means to be reconnected. Because truly, that's what happened to me 42 years ago the one who made me, the one who sin had separated me from, 
because I was conceived in sin. I was born in transgression, as David declares. Do you understand that you're a sinner by nature and by choice? You came into this world broken. You came into this world fallen. You came into this world with a sin nature that, listen, by no causation of your own, you got from Adam, the first man who brought sin into the world and death reigned because of that sin. And we came into this world a mess, would you agree? And we proved that we had a sin nature by our choices. And we made our life a greater mess. Would you not agree? Until that moment when God touched our hearts, not our heads. It's not an intellectual exercise. It's God Almighty reaching into a man's heart and touching something so personal and so deep and healing the wounds. That's why Jesus, quoting the Shema in the Old Testament, said, what God wants from you is that you should love Him with all of your heart. And that heart would make a convert of your head, then your mind, and then with all of your strength, with everything that is in you, you should love the Lord your God. And I'll tell you, when you understand what you were outside of Christ and what Christ has done for you, what God was willing to sacrifice for your redemption, for my salvation, for your salvation, man, your heart should be filled this morning with gratitude and thanksgiving. 42 years, I still marvel at the grace of God. I'm still blown away that God would save me because you know what? I wouldn't have saved me. I marvel in the fact, and I did this morning, getting up early and praying, I marvel at the fact that God loves me, that God wants to spend time with me. Not only does he love me, he likes me. That's the more incredible thing to me. The Bible declares that God is love, so he can't do anything but love. I know that he loves me. In fact, he loves the world. He loves every sinner. But you know this morning, guys, listen, gals, he not only loves you, he likes you. Now let me ask you a question. You spend time with people that you like, correct? Now you just went to a season where you had to spend time with people that you may not have liked. How many, don't raise your hand, had that experience. You know, you just tolerate, you know. If I can get through this meal, if I can just keep putting food in my mouth and not say anything and just, you know, not create any more controversy in my home and if I can just get home. Yeah, some of you had that. Some of you had that experience. But you know, God likes you. I know that's hard to believe. He likes you. He likes spending time with you. But you say, I'm a mess. That's right, you are. But you're his mess. And love covers a multitude of personal offenses. God sees you through the lens of his love. And he likes you. Matthew is coming to this realization because he had walked away from religion. You remember in, in Mark's gospel, and again, I think it's in Luke's gospel, his name really was Levi, the son of Alphaeus, which meant that he was schooled in the school of Levi's. He understood the word. He was practiced in, in, in religion, and he served in the temple, or would have, until he walked away because he saw the hypocrisy. And he seeks into the lowest depths of becoming a publican. And Jesus passes by and he looks at the man. Doesn't look at his sin. Doesn't look at his failure. He sees him. And he says, follow me. And Matthew follows him. And the rest of the discourse as we come now to chapter 9, verse 14, is going to be about relationship. Listen carefully, and not religion. So, we read there in verse 14, Then came unto him the disciples of John. Now this is John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. This is the one who preached repentance. Get ready, because the Messiah is coming. John the Baptist was the last 
Old Testament prophet and the first New Testament prophet. How can you say that, Pastor? Well, in this wise. He was the one who spoke of the Messiah that was to come, and yet he was the first one to point to him and say in John chapter 1, verse 29, and again in, in verse 36, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Something is happening. Notice very careful on the pages of Scripture as we move from the Old Testament to the New Testament because the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. The promised one from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 that would crush the serpent's head and bruise his heel in the process. The Redeemer, the Messiah, the Rescuer of humanity who was promised back in Genesis after the fall has now arrived. John declared him, repent, make straight the way because the righteous one is coming, the anointed one is coming, the Messiah is coming. And as he preached that, finally the time came when he could point to the one. This is extremely interesting and it should be extremely important for you and me because he pointed at the one that didn't just cover our sins because that's what the Old Testament did. All of those sacrifices that we've been studying about as we've been working our way through Leviticus and now as we're going into Numbers and all the types and shadows, that was the forerunner. Those were images of what Christ was to fulfill and to accomplish. Under the old covenant, your sins were never forgiven. They were never removed. They were covered. The word there is kofar. That's the word for atonement. When you would sin, you would take down a sacrificial lamb to the tabernacle and later to the temple. And there, as you put your hands upon the head of that sacrificial lamb and you would confess your sin, the priest would slit his throat and it would take the blood and offer it upon the brazen altar for your sins. And you would, you, you would, you would at that moment, because of that animal sacrifice, your sins would be covered, not removed. only covered. But when Jesus came under the new covenant, we're going to see as Matthew describes that. Your sins, my sins this morning, listen to me very carefully, are not covered. It's not that he took the sacrifices of lambs and bullocks and covered your sin. Understand this morning, Your sin, because of your confession and faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as the Redeemer, have not just been covered. Your sins for all time and eternity have been removed and you are forgiven. Do you understand? We don't struggle to receive God's approval, to garner His approval. We already have it in Christ Jesus. You not or shall be someday redeemed. You are redeemed today. Your sins past, your sins present, your sins future have been forgiven. The blood of Jesus Christ has washed you and I completely clean. We are not religious. We have a relationship through Jesus Christ with the God who made us. And we now can approach that God through the blood of His Son, through this new and living way, we can come right into the very holy of holies and receive help and mercy in a time of need because of what Jesus Christ has done. That's what Matthew is declaring. That's why 38 times he will say, it is fulfilled. 38 times and 28 verses, he's going to mention the fulfillment of prophecy. This is the one that we serve. The followers of John, his disciples, only understood, get ready, the Messiah is coming. And they only heard the preaching of repentance. And thus you need to fast and mourn for your sin. So the disciples of John come to Jesus and say, and they ask a question, why? And it's a good question. Why do we and the Pharisees fast often and your disciples don't fast at all? What's up with that? Why are we fasting, John's disciples, as he preached repentance and that we should mourn and we should be in grief for our sins, and we should fast, and we should pray. Why do the Pharisees fast, and yet your disciples, Jesus, don't? 
And Jesus gives a very interesting answer. You can read past it glibly and not understand it completely. But he doesn't talk about action. He talks about attitude. He talks not about the work of the hands, but the work of the heart. Watch what he says. Very interesting. And Jesus said unto them, verse 15, Can the child of the bride chamber mourn? As long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken, and the idea is by force, from them, and then shall they fast. Fasting is an interesting principle. Um, we know in the Old Testament that Moses fasted for 40 days when he was on the mount receiving the commandments. We know that Jesus fasted for 40 days in the wilderness. We know that in the oral law of Judaism at this time that every Jewish male fasted twice a week. You can read it in Luke's gospel. Remember when the guy came into the temple and he walked right up to the front and he lifted his eyes toward heaven and he thanked God that he wasn't like other men. And then he listed his accomplishments or his religious actions. And one of those things he said is, I fast twice a week. Monday and Thursday was the tradition. And the reason they fasted on Monday and Thursday is they believed that it was Monday that, G, that Moses went up to receive the commandments and it was Thursday that he came down from receiving the commandments. So in honor of the word of God or the commandments of God, they would fast twice a week, Monday and Thursday. Many of them didn't even know why they were fasting. But Jesus is saying, and it's interesting as we look at this and unpack it, that John's disciples fasted out of a sense of grief for their sin. That was the message of John. Repent. Make ye way. Make straight. So there was a sense of mourning. There was a sense of grief. There was a sense of despair. And thus they prayed and fasted and repented. We know from the scriptures that the Pharisees fasted to be seen of men. In fact, Jesus warned us, don't, don't you pray and fast as the Pharisees who want to be seen of men that make their faces long. The people would know that they're fasting. One motivation is to be seen of men. The other one is because you are grieved for your sin. But Jesus' disciples didn't fast because the bridegroom was there. And when the bridegroom is there and you're fellowshipping with the bridegroom, listen, your sins are forgiven. Hope is alive. Your future is real. Your sins are forgiven. And you don't do it to be seen of men. You could care less what people think about you. You're rejoicing in the fact that you are saved. Amen? And that's why people don't sit next to me and you shouldn't sit next to me when I worship. I've had people say to me, well, man, you know, you're a spectacle. Then don't look at me. Don't watch me worship. And I won't watch you. In fact, every one of you could sneak out of this building during the worship service, and I wouldn't know that you left. Or some of you sneak in during the worship service, and I don't know that you came in either. Because truly at that moment, when Ben begins to play, and he's the lead worshiper, he's not the worship leader, he's the lead worshiper, and he begins to worship. And I don't care how messed up his vocal cords have been for the last month and a half. He could be up here blowing on a kazoo and it wouldn't matter to me. Because I know at that moment that I get the opportunity with my brothers and sisters in Christ to raise my voice and to focus my heart on the one who saved me. On the one who forgave me of all my sin and continues to forgive me of all my sin has removed my sin as far from me as the east is from the west and that my sin and I still sin I don't want to shock any of you guys man I'm like Paul oh wretched man that I am the things that I should do I don't sometimes the things I shouldn't I do don't hold that against me you do it too As we're wrestling, as Paul said, the spirit man against the flesh man. And there's this constant battle. My prayer this morning is I got up early. Lord, please come quickly. Lord, I am so tired of this battle. How many are tired of the battle? How many just want to go home? 
Man, the most exciting thing to me, there's a couple of things. Can I just, this was cost you anything extra. Just a footnote. There are things that are very exciting to me about being in heaven. You know, I go from the spiritual to the carnal. But the spiritual part of it is, is number one, I'm going to see Jesus face to face. And I'm going to feel his touch on my cheek as he wipes every tear from my eyes. And I'm looking forward to that moment when he calls me son. The second thing is when I look down and I realize that I'm faultless. I get a new body and I'll never have to repent again. Sin will no longer be an issue because the only thing about sin is this flesh and I'm going to find the zipper one of these days and unzip this earth suit. My soul and spirit is going to go be with the Lord where I get a new body like unto his and I will be completely free of any sinful activity or any sinful influence. Can you say amen to that? Wow. And I'll even say it backwards when I get there. Wow. What an amazing thing. And then I can eat angel food cake at the marriage supper of the Lamb all I want and never gain a pound. I get a mansion that's already paid for. No more sweat of the brow. No more death. No more pain. The former things are done away with. Heaven will be a wonderful place. That's why Jesus said, man, you want to make sure that you make it to the extent that if your eye would offend, you pluck it out. If your hand offends, you cut it off. Do whatever is necessary to make that place your home. It'll be that amazing. It'll be that remarkable. And that's what Matthew has latched on to, this relationship. And he says, listen, can the people of the bride chamber mourn when the bridegroom is there? I'm going to tell you, I've been around this church long enough, 22 years now, that I've done enough weddings, and I see what goes on at weddings. I see how giddy the mother of the bride is and all the stuff that's going on weeks in advance for preparation. I have the meetings. They tell me how they're going to tear this part, place apart and fix it all up with just some odd looking. And I see what people dress in. Are you kidding? You wouldn't wear those dresses ever again but to a wedding. Why? Why? Some of them are gaudy and just extremely, I'm very careful, but you you know what I'm talking about. And the excitement, and I mean the night before when we're doing the wedding rehearsals, man, you can hardly get people to calm down to get, there's an excitement in the air. I've gone through four of those. And the very first one, there was such an excitement. And the wedding day finally came, and I'm in my tux, and I walk out of my house, and no kidding, I trip down the stairs and fall down in the tux. And I'm thinking, do I have holes in the knees? I'm having to go back in and clean myself up. I couldn't hardly function on my first daughter's wedding. And we get there, and the excitement, and then the wedding starts, and the ceremony is so beautiful, and then, then we move over to the, to the reception, and it's so beautiful, and man, we're eating, and people are fellowshipping, and we're having a great time, and we're rejoicing at Doug and Destiny's wedding. And then finally the time comes when we all have to walk outside. And this, this man is going to take my daughter away. I had to endure it with Doug. I had to endure it with Ben. I had to endure it with Brad. I rejoice with Micah because finally somebody liked him enough to marry him. That was amazing to us. But one day, he says, the bridegroom will be taken from you. And I'll tell you, for a week, I went into mourning. I understand what he's saying. We don't fast now Jesus is saying, our disciples don't fast now because I'm with them. And in his presence, the psalmist said, his fullness of joy at his right hand are pleasures evermore. I will tell you, if you're depressed or if you're discouraged, if you're going through a dark time, it's because you're not spending enough time with the one who is the source of all joy. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures evermore. That stuff just seems to dissipate. 
And that's what he's saying. But the time will come when they will violently take me from them and then they'll grieve, not for their sin, but grieve for that moment. See, that's the yearning. That's the longing in our hearts, is it not? Come quickly, Lord Jesus, even so come quickly. The cry of our hearts is Maranatha, Maranatha, Maranatha. Lord, we long for that moment when you fulfill that promise that you gave in John's Gospel, chapter 14, because you said, let not our hearts be troubled. You're going away to prepare a place for us. And when that place is done, and I think, man, I'm hoping, I'm praying that the last nail needs to be driven, that the last picture has to be hung, that the final touches of the paint are going on. If that's what it looks like, I don't care. Jesus said, I'm coming back for you. That where I am, you might be also. That's the blessed hope. That's the promise. That's what our hearts yearn for. I'm going to tell you, if your heart's not yearning for that, you're too connected with the world. Can I say that again? If every breathing moment that you're awake, there's not a consciousness of maybe today, could today be the day that Jesus comes again for me? I long and yearn to be in heaven. I long and yearn to have the new body that knows nothing about sin. I long and yearn to look into the face of the one who saved me, the one who loves me, who's been gracious and merciful to me beyond my wildest imagination, who rescued me to put hope when there was no hope, to feel his touch, to realize there will be no more sin, no more death, no more pain. Man, if that's not in your heart and you're just coming to the services, then you're religious. And Jesus is going to deal through that with Matthew. I pray that God owns your heart and he owns your thoughts and your passion. 42 years ago, I set my compass on heaven. And I'm living, and I'm living. I want you to know today, and you ought to be living. We're living for one point yet in the future when Jesus comes for the church. Amen? Now, some will call you escapists. Really? Do you want to be here? When we read about the things in Revelation, man, what is messed up with you? I've had been people going, well, you're just an escapist. Yeah, I am. You should be too. Have you read about the seven seals and the seven bowls and the seven... Have you read about those things? I don't want to be here. But that's not the reason why I long for heaven. It's not to escape the things that are coming upon this planet. And I'm going to tell you, the scene is being set for those things. I want to go to heaven because my Savior is there. And He already owns my heart. And I'm tired of failing Him. Amen? See, this is what Matthew's talking about. So he said, that's why the disciples, listen, don't fast. The bridegroom is with them. There's a time coming when they will fast. And notice how Jesus moves right in. He segues right into this wonderful teaching. And He says this, now watch carefully. He says in verse 16, No man putteth a piece of new cloth on an old garment. For that which is put in to it fills it up, and it taketh from the garment, and it rents and is made worse. What he's talking about is that new piece of material doesn't stretch. It is not as pliable as the old. If you sew a new piece on and it shrinks when you wash it, it tears away from the old garment and it rents it. And what is Jesus saying? I didn't come to patch up a religious system. Now, there are people today that are patching it up. I call them veil menders. You say, what in the world is a veil mender? You remember when Jesus died on the cross? It is recorded that the foundations of the temple split and the veil, which was 40 feet high, in the temple was thicker than a man's hand it rent from the top to the bottom and for the first time the holy of holies was exposed that's God's invitation because no longer would there be anything between God and man between his presence and you and me and historians tell us that you could hear the sound of that veil renting throughout all of Jerusalem as from the top. Notice from the top. God himself renting it from the top to the bottom. 
and the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat and the cherub and God's presence was now exposed to common man. That's him inviting us into his presence. No more the religious system. No more just the priest going into the holies and, and offering you know, the sacrifices before that and then once you're going into the most holy place. To all, all of that was a shadow and type. All of that was done away with on the, on the cross. That's, he can say to us, come boldly into my presence to receive help and mercy in a time of need. That was rent. He's not patching up an old system. Now, I don't want to offend any of you, but the Roman Catholics tried to patch it up. And they instituted the priesthood. And you've got to go to a priest in a little booth and confess your sins, and he'll take your sins to God. And they still have Jesus on the cross. And they still believe in transubstantiation where literally the wafer becomes the body of Christ and the wine becomes His blood because they don't understand that, that through that one sacrifice, once and for all, the sins were forgiven and we've entered into a new covenant, not with the priesthood. We have a high priest. We have a high priest. And we can go boldly to Him. I don't need to go to a man or to an earthly priest. I don't need to go through religious rites and rituals to garner God's pleasure, it's already mine. You say, well, you're kind of hard on the Roman Catholics. Not any harder than I am on the legalistic Protestants. Because there are Protestant churches today that will tell you when you sin, you lose your salvation. And you've got to perform to garner God's pleasure. And they're just as messed up with their religious system as the Catholics are with theirs. So I'm not any harder on the Roman Catholics than I am on the legalistic Protestants. To me, it's all a mess. And that Jesus calls us into relationship. Watch what he says here. As we move on into the rest of verse 17, neither do men put new wine. Now, new is kind of a deceiving word. We hear a lot about new. And I will tell you, if it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's not new. We're not looking for something different because the idea in our mind when we read the English word is new means it's something that's different. The word for new here in the Greek is active. Active wine. Wine that is still fermenting. It's active. There's, some, there's something still cooking in it. Now, the best way I can explain this to you, because you and I don't know anything about active wine, but we know about flat soda pop. Amen? How many, I'm going to confess a few moments about myself here. How many like root beer floats? How many have had one this week? How many had two this week? How many have ever had two in one day? How many have had two in one day in the last week? You can tell. I like root beer floats. And when my wife gets ready to go shopping during the week, I always ask her, can you get me, just get the cheap vanilla ice cream, the big tub. You know, the, I don't know how many gallons are in it. It lasts about four days. But whatever it is, <laughs> and, a, and, and, and get me a liter of mug root beer. Every time she asks, can I get you anything at the store? Ice cream, mug root beer. The bummer of it is, is when you first open the mug root beer, you have to be very careful. Why? Because it starts spitting and foaming and doing all this kind of weird stuff. You're not careful. You get it all over the counter. You get it all over the floor, and then you have to mop it up. So you over the sink. You very carefully crack the lid. Why? Because, man, whatever's going on inside of that root beer is active. About the sixth or seventh time you open the lid, nothing happens. You pour it onto the ice cream and nothing foams. Not, it's dead. It's flat. But the first time you open it, you can feel the pressure being relieved in the bottle. This is what Jesus is saying. That relationship with Him is so active that it cannot be contained in an old system. It cannot be contained in do's and in don'ts and religiosity because it's living. 
my heart 42 years ago got touched by a living God. And I entered into a living relationship with Him. And by the word, way, Hebrews 4 tells us that the Word of God is living and it is powerful and it is sharper than any two-edged sword and it pierces asunder the bone and the marrow and it goes right down into the heart issues. It's living. The Old Testament and New Testament are God's words to us and they are living. And then you are filled with the life-giving Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. You and I are filled with the Holy Spirit. And what he's saying is there ought to be something cooking in you. You better not be flat and just in an old skin, an old system. He's saying, man, there ought to be something cooking in you. You and I are filled with the Holy Spirit. Man, we are blood-bought and blood-washed. Listen, we have the living Word of God and we are living before a living God. He has made us alive. And there's something cooking in us. There's a passion. There's a relationship. There's a yearning. There's a longing. There's intimacy. Man, I am not religious if it means what I see about religious people. I have the true and living God living in me. Amen? That's what we're talking about here. That's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about a living relationship. Where your sins have been forgiven you where you have been cleansed by the Messiah, where your name is written in the book of life, where he's filled you with his spirit, where he calls you a son and a daughter. And he knows you by name. He knows your thoughts before you think them. And all he says to you, love me with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, because I love you that way too. And it's a love relationship that he calls us to. Matthew, after he mentions his conversion experience, his call of Christ to follow him, having been disillusioned by the religious systems of the world and having left it and become one of the greatest sinners, he now follows Jesus. And he records John's disciples coming to Jesus and saying, why do we fast and why do the Pharisees fast and why don't your disciples fast? Well, how can you fast? How can you be in mourning and grieving when you understand you've been forgiven and you're with the bridegroom? And then Jesus said, I've not come to patch up an old religious system. In fact, that old religious system won't be able to contain what I'm about to do because your sins are no longer going to be covered. They're going to be removed. And the Spirit is not going to be out there somewhere. It's going to be living in you. And you're going to be regenerated. Two scriptures I want to read to prove this point. We read in Hebrews chapter 1. They'll put it on the screen so you don't need to turn there. Hebrews chapter 1, the first three verses are remarkable to me. The first time I sought to study the book of Hebrews in preparation to teach it, it took me about two years to get through it. It's probably one of the most remarkable books in the, Old, in the New Testament because it is a bridge to the Old Testament. Really, I believe Paul being the author. I believe Paul wrote 14 books of the New Testament and this was one of them. People have argued the point whether Paul was the author or not because of some of the way the language is. But I want to tell you, I don't argue that because I think that Paul wrote it in Hebrew and Luke translated it in Greek. And that's why some of the Pauline flavor is lost because he's writing to Jewish people. Paul had a longing for the Jewish people to understand the gospel. But he begins this book in an incredible way. He, he bypasses all of the, you know, greetings and all of the defense of him being an apostle. And he simply gets to the point. He gets to the point right after chapter 1, verse 1. Watch this. He says this. God. He just begins with God. Everything begins with God. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past under the fathers by the prophets. Old Testament has in these last days, and listen, by the way, that doesn't mean last days as though the the, the Lord's returning soon. It means the last time that God is going to speak. You have the Gospels, Jesus teaching. You have the Epistles, people explaining what Jesus taught. And you have Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The New Testament's all about Him. That's why I love Matthew 38 times. It is fulfilled. And He says this, watch carefully hath in these last days 
spoken unto us by his son. The message was so important. The sacrifice of a perfect man was so needed that God sent his son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, by whom he made the world. He's the creator. Who being the brightness of his glory, the absolute Shekinah glory of God, Jesus is equal to that because he's the second person of the Godhead. The expressed image of his person. You want to know what Jesus looks like? I mean, God looks like you have to look no further than Jesus. Upholding all things by the word of his power. Colossians tells us that everything is held together because he chooses it to be held together by the word of his power. When he had by himself. Please read that. Did you help in this process? No. When he had by himself purged our sins. We get the word to catharize from that word. Catharizo is the Greek word. It means to remove all impurities from you. Jesus Christ by himself removed all of your and my impurities and he sat down to be seated means he's at rest. The work is finished. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's what Jesus did for you and me. Let's take a look at Titus chapter 3. That's why we're not religious. Because the work has already been done. We don't labor to be saved. We labor from, as we're going to see in Titus, and we're going to close with this verse, we labor from a position of already being forgiven. In Titus chapter 3, one of my favorite of the pastoral epistles, Titus is writing, and it's interesting, as he comes to chapter 3, verse 4, he says this, but after the kindness, now he's talking about a different covenant now, but after the kindness and love of God, our Savior appeared toward men. How did it appear? in the life of Christ. Up until that point, you had religious systems. You had sacrifices that only covered your sin. You had a system of religion. But no average person was ever filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit from time to time would come upon kings and come upon prophets. But it was easy for that same Holy Spirit to leave. That's why David cried when he sinned, take not your Holy Spirit from me, because there was the possibility of the Holy Spirit leaving David. Never with you and me. Because the promise in the new covenant is I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What a remarkable thing. Now listen carefully. But after that the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Now this is how he did it. By the washing of and the regeneration, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. I don't read anything about religion in there. Not by going to church. Not by doing good deeds. Not by any sacrifices that you have offered unto Him. But He offered the ultimate sacrifice for you. Now watch this. Which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that being justified circle that word it means to be made just as though you never sinned can you believe that do you understand this morning when God looks at you he doesn't look at you the mess that you are he sees those things that are not as though they already were he sees you through the sacrifice of his son he sees you perfect thus we read in Romans chapter 4 he refuses to put sin on your account because of what Jesus Christ has done then he moves into chapter 5 of Romans and says having been past his justified by faith you have peace with God God will never be angry with you again not only do you have peace with God you have hope in God and you have a standing in grace wherein you rejoice you see According to mercy, he saved us by the washing and the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, being justified by his grace, you're already saved. You're already justified. You're already accepted in the beloved. Now, we should 
as heirs according to the hope of eternal life, we should be faithful. This is a faithful saying. We should affirm these things constantly that we should believe in God that we might be careful now to maintain good works. Religion has the tail wagging the dog. I don't want the tail wagging the dog. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because they believe you have to earn it. You have to perform to a certain standard to receive it. When the gospel of Jesus Christ simply says to any man, to every man, to whosoever, if you will come to me, I won't cast you away. But I'll wash you and I'll regenerate you and I'll renew you through the work of the Holy Spirit and you can become born again. And at that moment, I will remove your sin from you as far as the east is from the west, never to be brought before you again because I took your sin and put it up on my son and he paid the price. When he said it was finished, he meant it was finished to tell us die. And now from a position of being redeemed, we maintain good works. We don't work to be saved. We work because we are saved. Amen? This is what Matthew is declaring to us. How remarkable this morning. How incredible to think this morning that your sin has not just been covered, it's been removed for all time and eternity and God sees you perfect. In fact, he declares that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Can you improve on that? Now why do you freak out? Why do I freak out? Because we don't understand what God has done. This morning I want you to understand if you are in Christ Jesus, God has forgiven you. But I'll tell you what happens if you're in Christ Jesus. There's something cooking in you. You are active wine. The wine is always in association to the gospel. Something is active in you. You're not flat. Man, there's something foaming in you. Your cup is pressed down, shaken together, and it's running over. And you love the Lord with all of your heart. And thus you walk away from the things of this world. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life are of the world. And this world is perishing. But he tells us, if the love of God be in you, the love of the world won't be. But if the love of the world be in you, the love of God can't be. You're either foaming or you're flat. You're either foaming or you're flat. That's what he's saying. And flat means to be religious. And I'm going to tell you that we have the potential as people who once were foaming to become flat. To settle into a religious system. And go through motions. Without truly having the Holy Spirit active in our hearts and in our lives. You don't think that's so? The very first warning to the very first church in Revelation chapter 2 is I know your works. I know your labor. I know that you cannot suffer those who say they're apostles and are not, but have found them to be liars. I know that you have labored and you have fainted not, but I have this one thing against thee. You have left your first love. Now repent. Go back. Do your first works over again, lest I come and remove you from my presence. Wow, those are sobering words, aren't they? What is he saying is, I don't want a religious system in my presence. What I want is people have a relationship with me. Amen? Do you, this morning, have a relationship with the living God through the work of His Spirit in your heart and through the authority of His Word? That's what He's looking for. Do you know this morning that you are forgiven because of what Jesus Christ did? And are you grateful and are you thankful? And have you declared him to be your Lord and your Savior? Then you're not religious. You have a relationship with the one who made you. Amen?
Amen. Well, the worship team will come. Ushers as well. We're going to have communion this morning. If you can, let's stand. I know that some of you can't, and that's okay to be seated. One of the reasons why I ask people to stand during communion is the simple fact that if Jesus could hang on a cross for six hours for us, we could stand a few moments for him. Amen? While we honor what this table represents. And let me just share it with you real quickly before we pass out communion this morning. Jesus said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are to remember some things. I want you to look at me. I want you to remember some things. You know why we have to remember some things? Because we forget. And that's what Peter said. You don't so much need to be taught as to be reminded. Amen? How many need to be reminded? The things you already know. I want to remind you this morning, when you eat this bread and you drink this cup, the first thing that should come into your heart is that God loves you. No greater love hath any man than he lay down his life for a friend. And Jesus said, I call you friend. That's the first thing we should remember. The second thing we should remember is that through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, through the shedding of his blood, through the stripes that he bore, you and I are saved. The price of our sin and the punishment of our sin has already been paid. And you this morning and I this morning, we're forgiven. We're not only loved, we're forgiven. Amen? And the third thing we should see here is the sacrifice. The Father gave His Son for you and me. And if He was willing to do that, what should I withhold from Him? The true answer should be nothing. Amen? Nothing. If you gave that for me, then what would I withhold from you? Amen? Those are some things to remember. And there's a lot of more. There's a lot more things to be remembered. I, 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 you can add to that list. But the first thing is God loves you. And God has forgiven you. He paid the price for your sin. And He did it through sacrifice. Amen? His sacrifice. And He calls you to a life of sacrifice. Amen? So let's pray. Father... Lord, as we come to this table, it's a very sacred moment. We don't believe that the bread and the blood literally transform into your blood and body. We believe that it is symbolism. But Lord, it is symbolism that is sacred to us because it reminds us, Lord Jesus, of your sacrifice, of your love, of how you paid for our sins and how we are forgiven speaks of your sacrifice for us, Lord. And so this morning, as in a few moments we're going to eat and drink together, Lord, we ask that you'd bless this table, bless this cup, and bless this bread as it's being distributed. And Father, we would ask that every person in the sound of my voice, whether listening by live stream or watching on the internet later or, or in the building right now, that we would take inventory. Very sober moment, that we would take inventory. And Lord, if we've been running fast and loose with the things of God, Lord, may we repent. If, Lord, we, we have lost that active, intimate relationship with you, if lo no longer, Father, the things of God are cooking in us, if we've grown flat and stale, Father, we would ask that you'd revive that. Lord, if we become religious, Father, then we need revival. Because you only revive that which is dead. And religion is dead. But relationship, Lord, is alive. And we'd ask that you do that too. May we not eat of this bread or drink of this cup in an unworthy manner. There are warnings about that, Father. But may we examine ourselves to see whether we're in the faith. And then speak to our hearts, we would pray this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's worship. Hold the cup, hold the bread as it's being distributed, and we'll eat and drink together in just a few moments. One day when heaven 
Hearts filled with His praises One day when sin was as black as could be Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin Dwelt among men, my example is He became flesh and light shine among us His glory revealed living He loved me dying He saved me buried He carried my sin far away rising He justified and rejected bearing our sins my redeemer is he the hands of you nations stretched out on the tree and took the nails from me living he loved me dying he said grave could conceal him no longer one day the stone rolled away from the door then he arose over death he had conquered now he's ascended my lord evermore Death cannot hold him, the grave cannot keep him from rising again. Living, he loved me, and dying, he saved me, and married, he carried my sin far away. Rising, he justified.
and every eye look this way just for a moment. You know, one of the most frustrating things as a pastor is trying to communicate what you know in your heart, what you've learned from the Word, and to put that in somebody else's heart. I don't want to put it in your head. I don't care what you know about Him if you don't know Him. Because to know Him is life. And I hope this morning what was communicated is, is that Jesus loves you. And if you confess Him as your Lord and Savior, He has forgiven you. And He's removed your sin. And He will never bring it before you again. And all He wants is a relationship with you. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. That's all he's after. That's all he's after. One of the most beautiful pictures in this scripture is in Jude, verse 24. Small, little epistle, one chapter. But in verse 24, one of the greatest truths you'll find in all of Holy Writ is declared to us. Because it tells us one day, Jesus is going to put his arm around us. He's going to walk us right into the very throne room of God, and he's going to introduce us to the Father. Can you imagine? And he's going to say, God the Father, I want to introduce to you Mike Warren. Mike Warren, God the Father. And at that moment, Jude declares, I'm going to look down. And I'm going to realize I'm wearing a garment that is so perfect and so pure that was purchased by Jesus Christ that I'm standing in the presence of a holy God. And I'm not being consumed. And not only am I not being consumed, I'm going to look down and realize that I am perfect. And I love the Jude says, with exceeding joy. Amen. And then Jude breaks out into this doxology. He just can't help himself. Unto the only wise and true God. Only God could have done that. Be honor, glory, might, and dominion, and power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. That's who we serve. We don't serve Calvary Chapel. We don't serve Gold Country Calvary Chapel. We don't serve any religious system. We serve the true and living God through His Son, Jesus Christ, who paid for our sins, who brought us out of this darkness into this marvelous light where we could have relationship with the God who created all things, who now lives in us, who's washed us and forgiven us, and who bids us every morning come into an intimate relationship with me. Bring your heart before me, and I'll fix the issues of your life. I'll make a promise to you. If I ever become religious, I will step out of this pulpit and I'll go sit down. But I'm still in awe. 42 years later, that God saved me. An amoral, drug abusing, hateful, stubborn, rebellious young man. But in a nanosecond, he changed me forever. Oh, I wish I could say that I've been faithful as he's been faithful to me, but I haven't. But he never stopped loving me, and he's never stopped calling me. He's never given up on me. He's never told me, change your name, pack your bags, and leave. In fact, in those moments of failure, I hear even the most kindest of words, get up. You can do this. I'll strengthen you. Amen. That's our Savior. Father, we thank you this morning for what this blood and what this bread or body represents. It represents the greatest gift we could ever receive. Now, Lord, we just went through Thanksgiving and we ought to be thanks thankful. And we're going into Christmas where we're going to celebrate the birth of our Savior. 
Lord, this morning we are thankful. We are thankful that you saved us. We're thankful, Lord, that we are forgiven. And we understand it's through the blood and the body that was broken of Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we eat and drink this morning, we're, Lord, we're going to eat and we're going to drink with the knowledge that we are already forgiven, forgiven and we stand in grace. And your grace is su sufficient and your mercies are new every morning and there's never going to be a time that you're not going to love us. In fact, you even like us. You call us sons and daughters. And Lord, for all of that, we thank you this morning. And we honor you by partaking at your table as you told us to do. And we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's eat and drink together. Thank you, Father. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Remarkable. Amazing. Oh, Father, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I love. only guys let's join in thank you this morning that we are yours and you are ours that you are our father and we've been made sons not like Jesus so to speak the only begotten but we've been grafted in we've been adopted we are still sons and daughters of the most high God and we thank you father for all those things you've done for us but most of all, Lord, we thank you that you have cleansed us. You have washed us. You have regenerated us and renewed us in the Holy Spirit and that we are born again. We thank you for the blessed hope. And Lord, the cry of our heart is, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Man, we are tired of living in this cesspool. We want to go home. And Lord, you don't even have to finish the mansion. Hey, we'll help you. Just come get us. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's kids would say, amen, amen. amen. God bless you guys. You're dismissed the fellowship.